Let me briefly introduce why bioinformatics for infectious diseases. I mean, why do we need a special program that is called bioinformatics for infectious diseases? How do we uh, think about infectious diseases compared to other types of diseases and conditions? And then I'll briefly introduce you to some of the challenges that are still being a hot topic in this area of research. And then I will pass it on to the mentors in the program that will speak about some of the technical aspects, including some of the case studies that we will use throughout the program. So Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases is a training program designed to introduce students, clinicians, and researchers to the role and the applications of bioinformatics to the study of pathogenic microorganisms and their interaction with the host, which lead to and enable human disease. And our understanding of the pathogenesis of these diseases can lead to meaningful interventions, interventions like antiviral drug design, or maybe vaccine design. We'll talk about this in just a few more minutes. So in this webinar, what we'll do is we'll use some of the examples that are case studies that we source from high impact publications and extract from their examples of meaningful application of bioinformatics methods of analysis to different types of omics data, including genomic data, transcriptomic data, metagenomic data, and others. And so what I'll do in my part of the presentation is I will give you a glimpse of how some of these different methods of analysis are used and have been developed to be applied to understand and intervene in these kinds of diseases, including some of the additional challenges that are still being researched and how we can leverage the publicly available data sets that are out there to be able to ask these questions of, uh, of uh, relevance and importance to what's happening right around us. So the infection itself, what, what is it? And, and why are we speaking about infectious diseases as a whole category of uh, applications of bioinformatics? So infection is the invasion of an organism's body tissues by disease-causing agents. Their multiplication and the reaction of host tissues to the infectious agents and the toxins that they produce. So an infectious disease is also known a, as a transmissible disease or communicable disease, and it is an illness that results from the entry or the actual infection and replication of that pathogen. So the infections that are caused by infectious agents called pathogens or include viruses, um, as well as agents such as viroids, which are not exactly viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, and then they are different from non-infectious diseases, which are also recognized as chronic and can be caused by such factors as the environment, nutrition, lifestyle, as well as genetic inheritance. So we typically think of them as two separate categories, but as we will see today, they actually have a lot in common and one can be the result of the other. So the replication of pathogens in the host leads to major interference, starting from membrane disruption, as in the case with viruses, and the release of toxins, as the case of many bacterial pathogens. Maybe of these, many of these interferences include molecular biological pathways that are designed to fend off intruders and signal to neighboring cells of danger. The pathogens can modulate these pathways and cause long-term organ damage, such as lung tissue scarring due to the immune hyperactivity. So understanding of these biological mechanisms, the way that the entry happens, the way that the body responds, the way that the uh, viral and uh, bacterial pathogens can uh, take and modulate those are all the subject of bioinformatics for infectious diseases because most of this information comes from data. So let's take a look at some example publications to see how this has been monitored and studied using different types of omics data. So the first example I wanna bring up is the outbreak of Ebola virus that happened in the 2014-2016 outbreak in West Africa and led to almost real-time genomic surveillance of this disease. As a result, genomic technologies were shown to be effective and useful in an outbreak of an epidemic and led to significant interventions like the discovery of antiviral compounds and design of vaccines. And so as a result of genomic surveillance, better understanding of the disease and intervention was a meaningful success that shows how valuable 
genomic data is, and therefore bioinformatics, which allows us to study this kind of genomic data and find meaningful insights in this data. Another example that I have here is an example from SARS-CoV-2. So obviously living in the pandemic, the role of genomic surveillance allows us to answer key questions about where did the virus emerge from? How is it developing over time? And how can we anticipate future directions for this viral replication and evolution in order to be more effective at the types of interventions that we can implement, including the testing of whether standard interventions that we think are effective or advanced interventions that we might not think are effective at all could be applied in a meaningful way to contain this pandemic. Another example that you can see here is the genomic surveillance of Plasmodium falciparum, which is malaria that is endemic in some areas of Africa. And still to this day, after millions of deaths uh, has not been uh, addressed using a vaccine. So to understand this specific pathogen, genomic surveillance is being used, also to understand various factors that lead to greater transmission, uh, replication, severity of disease, and as a result, we can see how interventions are being developed and tested that are becoming more and more effective to contain this disease. Another interesting article that is uh, fairly recent is the increased serological response against human herpes virus 6A, which is associated with risk for multiple sclerosis. This idea has been proposed back in the 1990s, but only recently have there been validated studies that show that indeed there is a statistically significant association between human herpes virus and the development for multiple sclerosis, which leads us to think about many other types of diseases that we think are purely neurological or perhaps uh, genetic and, and a result of somatic mutations like cancer, but in fact are caused by different types of infectious agents, pathogens. For example, here are the seven known viruses that cause human cancers. So an estimated 12% to 20% of cancers worldwide are thought to be uh, uh, resulting from tumor viruses. So we're not only speaking about infectious diseases that can be monitored and studied using omics data, we're also speaking about other diseases that we haven't asked about what caused through, but those associations are started to be uh, important to understand. So those were viruses. What about bacteria? Bacteria are another pathogen. Some bacteria could be pathogenic. And interestingly, you can see this article here that was uh, from 31st of January in 2022, the staggering death toll of drug-resistant bacteria, which talks about a global survey that shows that in 2019, antimicrobial resistance killed more people than HIV or AIDS or malaria. So not only do we see that viruses, parasites, but also bacteria is a major cause for global health. Not only that, we also see that drug-resistant tuberculosis poses a major risk to global health security. And we all hear of antimicrobial resistance in hospitals, of new superbugs that are not even known how to be treated. So this area of research is not only interesting, is not only relevant because of the pandemic that we're living through, but it is also a major direction for anyone who's interested to apply bioinformatics skills and data analysis skills to address major challenges that we face today and will continuously face in the future. One of the interesting things about the different pathogens that we discussed is that naturally our body already has a response to many of these infectious pathogens. Hosts can fight infection using their immune system. The mammalian hosts react to infections with an innate response, often involving inflammation, followed by an adaptive response. Vaccines are used to train the immune system to identify pathogens and store the necessary epitopes for antibody production in the long-term immune memory. But due to a variety of factors, such immune responses can be insufficient on their own. Two main approaches that have significantly reduced death from infectious diseases in the past century are the antibiotics, antiviral drugs, and vaccines. In fact, if we look at the timeline, 
we can see that the vaccines have been discovered first, but many other uh, uh, ways to intervene have reduced significantly the risk that infectious pathogens cause uh, or um, uh, pose. So here you can see from the 900s all the way to 2000s, this is the rate of infection, which is uh, per 100,000 population per year. You can see here simple interventions. For example, uh, uh, health departments, establishment of health departments, or continuous municipal use of chlorine in water in the United States. Uh, you can see the um, uh, kind of how specific diseases that we think maybe are you know, well into the past have actually not been so uh, long ago. So this is the influenza, the flu pandemic that killed millions of people, uh, plague, uh, that was uh, uh, last observed here in the 1920s. The use of penicillin, if you think of penicillin as something that was uh, you know, discovered long ago, you can see that actually that was in the 1940s, so not that long ago, and the first vaccine that was introduced in the 1950s. So all of this is recent history. This is the history that many of us have uh, seen our parents go through or grandparents we know that these things have happened very recently. And a lot of the developments that we are using today are based on these kinds of interventions. But over the since we see such tremendous decrease in uh, these kinds of pathogenic diseases, one might think that, well, we've mastered uh, the way to train our immune systems and protect ourselves from these pathogens. But in fact, we see that COVID-19 has proved all of us wrong. Here you can see uh, this is a comparison to different other causes of death and COVID-19 surpassed all of them, which shows clearly that we have not mastered the art of, of understanding and being able to effectively intervene with these uh, different pathogens. However, what does give us some promise? So bioinformatics, I think, is one of those disciplines that allows us to be, to stay, uh, you know, uh, somewhat optimistic about the future of infectious disease research. And the reason I say that is because with COVID-19, what we have seen is the continuous application of bioinformatics and data science to practical interventions that are being used in real time and are being used to adapt a response quickly to this dramatic threat that we now understand much better and we know how to intervene much better as well. What is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics is the intersection of computer science, biology, and statistics. And what I mean by that is that we are able to apply algorithms and software, rely on databases of different types of data, and use these data science skills to be able to analyze data. But this data isn't meaningful unless we understand the biological context. And so the biological context, the specifics of infectious diseases, the pathways, the different pathogens, the biology of the interaction between the host and the pathogen, all of those are a critical component for us to be able to ask meaningful questions and find answers that are significant and relevant to the type of data. Now, in the middle of that are statistical and machine learning or analytical skills that we need to and those analytical skills primarily are driven by our ability to structure data and then ask questions that are generalizable. These questions are not only relevant to a particular study, they're relevant in general to some biological phenomena. So one of the important things in the context of infectious diseases is that particularly in this area, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of data size, uh, data uh, databases and data types that are available for infectious disease research. So here you can see, this is a slide from maybe a few months ago, but you can see here that the rate of discovery of viral genomes, the way that these databases have become structured and accessible is increasing dramatically. And that means that we can start asking meaningful questions about all of these types of questions that we might have that we just learned about in a fairly easy and user-friendly way. And so the purpose of training in the context of bioinformatics for infectious diseases is to start thinking, 
How can I ask an important question? What kind of examples can I follow? And where can I find data sets that will provide me with sufficient answers that I'm looking for? Because even though so much has been already done, not everything is clear. In fact, we know that the diseases that are caused by pathogens vary significantly between individuals, locations, or even whole populations. They happen at different speed, at different severity, and the understanding of how they happen is linked to a very deep understanding of the immune responses as well as the uh, evolution of these pathogens. And not only that, we also are now discovering that many of these viruses and emerging pathogens are actually not only in uh, individuals, but they also are uh, in the environment. They're all around us. They're in other animals and uh, other species. And so we have to expand our understanding of this molecular biology to also be able to detect specific types of uh, pathogens like viruses uh, in other environmental samples that we might not have thought of yet. And that leads us to this major challenge of annotation and curation of data to understand relationships between strains, species, and phyla of different pathogens, and our ability to then understand their function. How do they function? How do they interact with the host? So in the context of this program, one of the key technologies that we're going to be using and we're going to be talking about a lot is next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing could be used in many different ways. It could be used to analyze individual genomes like the COVID-19 genome. It could be used to analyze metagenomes where we have a collection of genomes in a particular sample and we need to understand diversity or maybe relationships between these genomes. And also we need to understand the different types of library preparation techniques and steps to prepare the data to make sure that we can answer specific questions. Now, to be able to use this data, we need to understand the biology, we need to find the right kinds of data, and then we need to know a variety of techniques that will make it easy for us to interpret and find meaningful associations. And that includes understanding of viral genomics and evolution or phylodynamics. How can we build phylogenetic trees and monitor progression over time, connecting it with uh, temporal or maybe different types of phenotypes that we have. Understanding of transcriptomic data or how to find differences in gene expression and compare and contrast different types of conditions or groups of samples. Variant calling where we can find variants in specific positions of, on the genome and be able to interpret them. And analysis of metagenomic data, data that contains thousands or even millions of different microorganisms that need to be categorized and uh, found relationships between them. The examples you, I'm sure that you have seen um, you know, in the news and elsewhere, but the examples that we will use in this program include uh, uh, such epidemics like the Ebola virus, which you can see right here, the understanding of origins, transmission, replication and development of continuous evolution in this pandemic and how it affects our body's ability to respond to infection and produce relevant immune responses, differentiating between specific processes and stochastic processes, and then linking this understanding with our ability to take a sample and monitor the specific types of uh, 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 clades and variants that are of concern. And ultimately being able to translate this information to report on our findings, communicating the results effectively with meaningful annotation and interpretation. So to summarize, what we will do in this program is we will take a look at different types of, of omics data, including genomic, transcriptomic, and metagenomic data. We will learn to deal with these data sets, align them, uh, find associations using different types of processes, interpret them using our understanding of structure and function of different genes and proteins, and then measure host responses to really understand how does the host respond 
to the different infections that are there. Now, data from next generation sequencing is very complex. This is an alignment of one of the first sequencing data sets from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, samples uh, that were identified in China. And so as you can see here, it's not trivial to get from this kind of complex information to some meaningful insights. And so what we will try to do is we will try to break it down to understand the principles behind the data that we have, the analysis methods, that help us to perform some of the functionality in a semi-automated way, link that with biological understanding of the processes that drive the observed variation that we have in the data, and then use analysis methods that help us link those into meaningful models behind the process that we think is driving this variation. Now, ultimately, we will also talk about ways to interpret such data, not only find specific variation that is meaningful, but, but then also use the appropriate route for interpretation. And we will use different examples to link this kind of sequence variation to actual interaction and function of different proteins that anyone can do independently once you find the relevant meaningful differences in your data sets. Now, to speak about specific examples of how this type of bioinformatics approach can be used to study viruses, bacteria, and different types of uh, um, pathogens, I want to invite our mentors that will be helping you work through these different case studies, apply these different technical methods, and find meaningful insights from relevant biomedical publications. I want to introduce you to our mentors. Uh, Dr. Raghavendran uh, is going to be your research consultant and mentor. He's going to be helping you understand some of these topics and guide you in the specific case studies. Uh, Dr. Priyo Paul is going to be a teaching assistant that will help you uh, understand any kind of technical issues that you will have throughout this training. And Dr. Muhit Mazumdar, who's also a project mentor and an expert in computational biology, who will talk about how sequence and structure poses some interesting insights and future directions for this kind of research. So uh, Dr. Raghav, I want to invite you next to talk about um, some of the examples that we discussed. 